I felt them uh, all week. I feel them now, and I feel uh, very blessed to be a part of this uh, body of believers. And just thank you so much for your care, your love, your concern. I know there was not only prayers, worry, and all kinds of other things going out for me, but uh, Lord's hand is at work, and uh, He is good. Amen? For whom the Lord loves, He chastens. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be continuing our study in Hebrews chapter 12, looking at verses 4 through 13. In chapter 12, we come to that place in Hebrews where... Really, these believers have come to a place where, hey, it's time to go. We've done enough talking. We've made enough arguments. We've put enough, you know, uh, things out there for you to to be able to deal with. Now it's time to put into practice. It's time to walk the walk, basically, is what the writer is saying as we get to this uh, part of Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, We do a book-by-book, verse-by-verse study at Calvary Chapel, and so we have worked our way through uh, the book, and we have come to... Uh, this place where the writer is writing to fearful believers, Jewish Christians who are struggling in their faith. They're ready to give up. They're ready to go back to their spiritual roots of Judaism. But the writer is encouraging in them to press on in their faith. Many arguments have been given as to why they should believe. Why faith in Jesus Christ alone as the means of a right standing before God, is all that they need. Though they have been uh, threatened, basically, with persecution, with frustration, with temptations, with ridicule and intimidation by non-believing Jews and their religious Jews in their midst, those who have been holding on to the practices of the Old Covenant, the writer has just said, keep looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. As he too suffered, but he finished the course that was set before him, and he has now established the new covenant in his blood. Verse 4, where we pick up this morning, is a follow-up to verses 2 and 3 that we looked at last time, where the writer says that Jesus has suffered more than anyone, even to the point of death in finishing the race. Now, none of these had come close to this, as he says in verse 4, and by the way, does anyone need a Bible this morning? If you need a Bible, just raise your hand and we'll get a Bible in your hand. We need one over here, one back there. Anybody else need a Bible? One over here, one over there. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, I'll just hang out while we get some Bibles in your hand. So you're going to be looking for the book of Hebrews. It's in the back of the Bible. If you need to know where that is, it's the back. It's the left side or is it the right side? Let me get my magic marker out and I'll write on there. (laughs) The book of Hebrews chapter 12. Okay, when you get there, let me see hands. Hey, thanks for coming today to just worship Jesus Christ here this morning with us. It's awesome. Chapter 12, Hebrews verse 4. You have not yet resisted the bloodshed striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they be joyful for the present, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that which is lame may, be, may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. And this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Father, bless your word, and bless the hearts of those who have gathered this morning, Lord, that we may gather wisdom, Lord, that we may be encouraged, Lord, that we may be challenged if we need challenge today, may, that we may be rebuked, Lord, if we need rebuke. But Lord, we come because this letter 
And this book is probably one of the greatest encouragements in the Bible for believers to press on. And so, Father, today as we press on, we ask God that our hearts would just be softened today to hear what the Spirit would say to us. Teach us, God. Teach us your way, Lord. Give us, God, confidence. Confidence in you, Jesus, as we look unto you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, may we hold on to that as we run the race. And so, Lord, today, we thank you that you would meet us here in the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your love upon our lives. For the grace, God, that you have given us and the hope that we have through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we come today to honor you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. The writer says, you have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. None of these believers had come close to bloodshed in their testimony and in their faith of Jesus Christ. None of us have as well. The battle that they were going through, as ours most often is, is a struggle in our heart and in our mind. And what a battlefield that can be, right? Focus on where we're going and not look back and be discouraged. Not getting distracted from how far we've come and how much further we, we have to go. But Satan can be relentless. Do you think I wasn't fighting some spiritual battles last week as I was getting ready for surgery? Hey, let me tell you what. There were all kinds of things that the enemy was bringing up to me. He was all over me. You know, the, Jesus said he would come on as a, as a roaring lion. And he came on as a roaring lion. It's amazing how vulnerable we can become in a situation such as that. But again, I thank you for your prayers because your prayers is picking up the fight. You know, and giving us strength to go on as we press on towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus as we run the race. I can't tell you how much your prayers helped me get through those moments. Because I can tell you that two weeks, at least two weeks before, before that surgery, there were some battles going on in my mind as the enemy was bringing up all kinds of stuff. You know, stuff that should be back because it's been covered in the blood of Christ. But yet he loves to torment us. He loves to just have at us as best he can. I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, he says that we're to be casting down imaginations and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to obedience of Christ. We can think and worry ourselves into more battles that wear us down in our heart in our mind, and in our mind than any physical battles that will ever be engaged in. Those battles of faith and unbelief. When telling Peter about the race that he would run, the battle that he would fight, Jesus told him, Satan's going to try to sift you like wheat, casting doubt in your heart concerning your trust and your faith in me. Doubt and unbelief are two of the biggest weapons that the enemy can bring against us, even today. But you see, it's all about faith. And it's all about trust. And that's why it's of the utmost importance for us as we run the race with diligence, as we prepare for the battle that is before us, that we follow through with the training exercises no matter what the cost. You know, when, when maybe you get into a, um, say, a weight loss exer training program, or maybe let's say you're just training for a race. Let's just say you're training for something like the boulder boulder. You know, you have to be persistent. It's hard. You know, I don't want to get up every day and know that I have to go through this regiment and this routine because if I don't go through this regiment and this routine, it's going to wear on me. It's going to wear me down. But I know that if I press on, I know that if I go on and, 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 and do the, the regiment and properly train, then I'm going to be able to run that race. And I'm going to be able to run that race with confidence. 
because I have properly trained. And so what is our training exercise that we go through? I think if you just jot down Acts 2.42, that might help. Because we're to keep that appointment with God, to fellowship with Him in His Word on a daily basis. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We're to communicate with Him in prayer. One of the greatest privileges that we have as believers is to be able to communicate with the one true living God. The writer of Hebrews has told us to come boldly under the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy to find grace to help in time of need. And so we communicate with our God in prayer. We read His Word. We have fellowship with the brethren. Don't slack up for a minute. Because if we do, what happened to these believers in Hebrews could very well happen to us. And the sin of unbelief has an open door in our heart. But if that happens, I think as believers, the one neat thing that we know, God will do what's necessary to get us refocused because He is a loving Father. And whom the Lord loves, He does chasten, and He does rebuke, and He does correct, and He does train. God will do what's necessary for us to refocus because He loves us so much. These believers, as we read earlier, had drifted away from the Word. And what happens when we drift away from the Word? Then, you know, the little doubts start to come in to our heart and our mind. And then when the little doubts come in, you know, as we go along and things just don't seem to flow the way that they should, then we become discouraged. And they had, they had drift away from the Word. They began to doubt the Word. They were now discouraged and they were in the process of disregarding the Word altogether. The living Word of God, which is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit which is a lifeline for us as we feed upon the Word, as we're strengthened by the Word. It is so important that the Word is taken seriously in our lives. The writer says in verse 5, Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. This is a quote from Proverbs 3. Our Selah this morning from Revelation chapter 3 verse 19 says, As many, Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Seems like a pretty simple process. If the Lord corrects us, if the Lord speaks to our hearts, be zealous and repent. Because God does love His children, He will chasten us. He'll chasten us to keep us focused on the goal. What's the goal of your life? I've set the Lord always before me. I want to have Him before me. I want to be conformed into the image of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to be in that mold. He loves us. He will chasten us to keep us on the path. To keep us in the race. He will chasten us. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. Every son and daughter Every son and daughter. Why? Because we're frail. Because we're weak. And because we all have the tendency, like sheep, to go astray, don't we? All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Because our Lord is the good shepherd, He won't let us wander very far before He gets the rod and the staff and brings us and, 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 and to bring us back into that place of fellowship with Him. His love, it draws us back. Now, He uses different means. And there are different ways that He will chasten us. And there are different reasons why it may be necessary for Him to correct us. That word chasten is used eight times in these verses. Eight times. And what the word means, it it actually involves all discipline and correction necessary to help a child grow and mature. Mature. It's all about training and educating. That's what the word really means. It's, it's a training process, an educating process. Notice also the word son. He speaks whom the Lord loves. Uh, you know, he chastens in every son. The word son refers to adult sons 
or children. Not little kids. He's not talking about little kids here. He's talking about adults. Those in a place of accountability and responsibility. As adopted sons and daughters, as Paul writes about in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, and Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, believers have been given an adult standing. We're not brought in as, as really little babies, but we, I mean, we, we are, we have to learn, but we have been given an adult standing in relationship with the Lord. So we have accountability. We have accountability in our lives of, re, as, of representing Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And we want to give a good witness to the Lord. So the quote from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 that we just read is a reminder of God's love for His children. And it says, don't take it lightly. Whom the Lord loves, He chastens. Don't take it lightly. Nor, he says, don't be overwhelmed or discouraged by it. To take the discipline, God's discipline lightly, is a very dangerous position to take. Why? Because it suggests that what he says to me is not important. If I take his discipline lightly, his correction, his training, his educating, then if I take it lightly, then I'm saying, then His Word is not that important to me. Let me tell you, when God takes time, when He takes time to speak to our heart because of His love for us, to correct us and to discipline us, to teach us and to train us in the ways in which we should go, then we better take note and we better learn from it. Otherwise, the tendency is to become calloused with a hardened heart. And it was beginning to happen to these believers. As they began to drift from the word, they began to doubt the word. You think about Moses. You know, Moses wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. And, and you know, here he was, you know, with the children of Israel for 40 years, wandering around, you know, in the wilderness for all that time. And one little boo-boo. God must we... <laughs> what do you mean, we, Mo? <laughs> And God wouldn't let him in. Couldn't God have lightened up a little bit? Cut him a little slack, so to speak? He'd been 40 years with these murmuring, moaning, complaining children in the, in the wilderness. And God said, you're not going to lead him in. There's a lesson that he needed to learn. There's a lesson many times that we need to learn. God's never going to be too tough on us. We'll show you in a few minutes. He starts out pretty light. He's never going to be too tough on us. He's a gentle God. He's a gentle God. But remember when God is working in our lives, as Paul wrote in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See, condemnation tells me of no hope. Conviction tells me that i got hope. That's the reason that he's dealing with me in the first place. So, so, I mean, you know, many times, you know, it's like, and, and I worry about this sometimes as I, as I prepare messages, and you know, sometimes they're harder than others, so to speak, you know, sometimes they're a little more, you know, they, they sound severe. And, and you know, sometimes you can, you, can, you can get to, well, God, Lord, am I beating the sheep? No, it's not to beat the sheep ever, and I hope I never come off as, 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 as one who is cracking the whip to beat the sheep, because... The Word of God is that to encourage us. And if there's conviction in our heart, it's because God loves you. It's because I love you as, a, as, a, as an under-shepherd of the Lord. And if I know that there are things that are going on in your life that are hurting you, that are only going to hurt you more and more, and if I have to speak hard things to you in order for you to hear that, then that's something that you have to deal with your loving Father. Not me. I'm not Father Richie. <laughs> but your Father which is in heaven. You know, I'm just a sheep like you. I just happen to be an under-shepherd of the Lord. But there is therefore now no condemnation. The reason that God's speaking to your heart in the first place is so you move on. Move on. God's discipline is to strengthen us. It's to encourage us. It's to build us up. Now, of course, the question might be, how do I know those difficult times in my life that I face, 
how do I know if it's really God disciplining me or if it's something else, say maybe my own stupidity or maybe an attack of Satan? Well, let me just say, more often than not, we know when God's hand of discipline comes upon us. Because probably we have allowed ourselves to compromise in some area of our life that is displeasing to Him, and now He's going to deal with it. Now, I don't think I have to go into a great you know, number of examples here, list off a great number of examples. But you can be sure... If you're claiming to be in a relationship with God and are living in a relationship outside of His will, living with someone as a husband and wife, and you're not married to them, you can be sure that God's going to deal with you. He's going to deal with you. If you're dating a non-believer, dangerous situation. God's going to deal with you. If you're an internet abuser, secret sins, maybe you like to gamble on the internet, maybe you like to look at some of the things that come up on there that you shouldn't be looking at, God knows and He'll deal with it. If anger or lying or gossiping alcohol, or even what they call recreational drugs. Christians do. Yeah, unfortunately. You know what? They need to be reminded that this is not pleasing God. These things do not please God and are slowing you down, and He'll address them. You see, most often than not, it's something that we know. It's not something that we don't know when God is chasing us. But if we aren't sure and you're still wondering, then I think one way to sort it all out is just to treat all and any kind of adverse trials or difficulties that we're experiencing in our lives as opportunities to learn and to grow and to mature. Remembering that all things work together to good to those who love the Lord. All things, not some things, everything. All things work together to good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. If it's our own stupidity, or if it's an attack of Satan, and you're a child of God, then God's going to have a hand in it anyway. He's going to have a hand in it anyway, because He loves us and He cares for us more than we ever could care for ourselves. Now, Satan doesn't want us to believe that when trials come in our life. And we're praying, God, what do you want to see? And you know, it's like days, weeks, and like the Lord's, you know, months, you know, the Lord's working, He's doing something here, you know, and and the thing Satan, you know, wants us to believe that God doesn't care about you, but He does care about you. And the truth remains, whom the Lord loves, He chastens. And so in verse 7, He says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. Remember, adult sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? If you are a child of God... If you have come to a personal and living relationship with God through faith in, his Christ, faith in Jesus Christ and into His family, then you have been adopted into His eternal family, and you can expect His loving hand of guidance and training and discipline at some point in your life because He loves you. And He wants to see you grow, and He wants to see you mature, and He wants to see you become a strong and obedient child. It's no different with, with our own kids. No different with our own kids. If He is your heavenly Father, then He will discipline His own just as we do our own kids. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, I must be getting away with something that's maybe not that bad because God hasn't chastened me and I know I'm not exactly living the way that I should. Well, then you better take heed to the next verse. Look at verse 8. If you are without chastening of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Pretty cut and dry, isn't it? This should indeed be cause for worry. Not the chastening hand of God upon your life that says He cares, but the lack of it. Especially if one believes that they are His child and are not experiencing any apparent consequences for their sin. It doesn't work that way in God's economy. Because God does love us. 
He will chasten us. Now, sometimes Christians don't like the fact that God does discipline us. But we should put it into perspective. If He doesn't, then you're not His. If He doesn't, then you're not His. You see, we're fallible. We're selfish kids. And sometime in our walk, we're going to go off. We're going to, as much as we want to stay right on that straight and narrow path, we're going to go off and God's going to remind us. He's going to correct us. And so we're to take it and we're to learn from it. One commentator said, form the habit of heeding his taps and you'll be less likely to receive his raps. Form the habit of heeding, heeding, hearing, listening. So how does it all come into play in our lives? Well, first of all, most often and first, there will be a rebuke. Something in His Word. I told you God is gentle. There will be a rebuke. Something in His Word. Maybe something that you heard in a message at church or on the radio. Something that convicts you. Convicts you in your heart that says, That's me. If God is speaking to you about something that you know He is dealing with in your life, then take heed. Jesus said, Take heed. Heed to my word. Take heed how you hear my word. The first bit of chastening comes in the form of a rebuke. If that doesn't get your attention, there will be the chastening hand. Some circumstance, maybe health, maybe financial, something to get your attention that you're wandering away off the path to set things in order in my life. God used my marriage, my relationship with Nancy. And he shook things up in it pretty good. After seven years, we were separated for seven months. But it was all because he wanted to get things in order in my life. Me first. Not me. Him. And then everything else. What's Matthew 6.33 say? Want to look there? Go ahead. A little rebuke. Right from his word. If that doesn't get our attention. A little chastening of his hand. What's Matthew 6.33 say? Seek Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else going to fall into place, isn't it? (laughs) Isn't that amazing? That's a promise of God right there. Seek. Seek Him first. And so that's what He really wants us to do. But He's going to do what's necessary. If that doesn't work, if His chastening hand, some circumstance, something happening in your life that really gets your attention, then He says, as a last resort, every son whom He loves, He will scourge. He will scourge. The wayward son or daughter. Let me just say with that, it's a serious matter to let sin go unchecked in our lives. It can be a habit. It can be an attitude. It can be a lot of different things. unchecked in our hands when the Lord has rebuked us, if he's had to chasten us, it's a very serious matter to let sin go unchecked in our lives as his children. But better to be disciplined than not. Because when we're disciplined, we know that we are his kids. If you think that you're getting away with something that God calls sin in his word, then your sin will find you out. And God will deal with it. So he says, confess your sin because he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Furthermore, verse 9, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid attention, we paid with respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? So even as we show respect and honor 
to our human parents, our earthly parents, who have shown us love by disciplining and correcting us when we disobeyed or went astray so much more. So much more, he says here. Shall we not readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? When God brings something to our attention, something that he knows is not, it's not good for us, it's going to hurt us, he wants to protect us. Something that's going to cause trouble in our lives. Should not we more readily be in subjection to him? You know, it's a sad scenario today. This is a very busy society. Now, busy, we told you the acronym is Burden Under Satan's Yoke. But there are a lot of parents today who do not take the time with their children that they should. And their children are left to their own vices to do whatever whatever they want to do. And we see a society today that's really just crumbling where the fabric of our society is just unraveling from within because our kids have not been given love and attention. You know, the scripture says in Proverbs, you know, if you, if, if, you, if you correct your child and he cries, he said, well, know that he's been trained by it because if you don't do that, if you don't correct them, if you don't teach them, if you don't train them, if you don't educate them, then they're going to go off with their own agenda. I was talking to my little grandson this morning as he was having breakfast. His mom asked him, you know, to do something. And I think she was talking to maybe one of the other grandsons. But so, so I asked the one that was sitting at the table, uh, do you have an agenda? He says, what's an agenda? And I said, that's when you want to go off and do your own thing. You know, because the other grandson wanted to go off and do his own thing when, when the mom, you know, when Timmy said, do this, you know. And there was some correcting that was about ready to take place. And so I asked the other son, you know, grandson, I said, do you have an agenda? (laughs) So sometimes, you know, we, but we show love. We show our kids that we love them, that we care for them because we do discipline them, because we do train them. Now, society today, you know, uh, this is a whole subject that, you know, is, is dangerous to get into sometimes. But, you know, society would say, you know, one thing in the Bible, and in that case... What the Bible says is how I have to obey. Now, I don't do it in such a way that I get out of control. But we do need to train our kids up and discipline them. For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us, our human parents, as seemed best for them. But he, for our prophet, that we may be partakers of his holiness. See, earthly parents, because we are that, earthly parents, correct our children, for the most part, with good intentions. We do it with good intentions. But sometimes this isn't true. And we need to be very careful about this because you might be tired from a busy day. And you may have been talking to your child and they, you, know, you may have been frustrated because the verbal rebuke, remember that's the first one, the verbal rebuke didn't register. And so now you know you've gotten into that routine where you've given about ten more verbal rebukes. Didn't you hear what I said? If I have to say this one more to you know, and man, you know, you're flexing your and you're getting hot, and the next thing you know, all right, come here, we're gonna have to talk about this in another matter, you know, and, and we've lost control. And no longer are we really training our kids or disciplining, but we're taking our frustration out on them. And that's the point where we need to be very careful about. Very, 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 very careful about. Because we might lose it. And all of a sudden, we're not really doing what's best for them. But it's really what's best for me. I want to end this right now. But God always corrects us with our best interest at heart. He always disciplines us with our best. He does it for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Never will God discipline and correct us for any other mean than for our best, that he has our best interest at heart. He is a loving father. Let us know that. Some of you may not have grown up in homes or families, you know, where you had the most loving of parents. And, and sometimes, you know, that can give us a weird view of our father who is in heaven. Our heavenly father, who is a loving father. And who only has our best interest at heart. And it's hard sometimes, it's hard for people sometimes to differentiate. You know, well, my earthly parent was like this, so my heavenly father must be like that. No, he's probably a whole lot different. He's probably a whole lot different than any of our earthly parents. 
Because God is love, bottom line. And he loves us so much that he wants us to grow and to mature. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Nobody likes to be corrected. Nobody likes to be disciplined. Come into grips with, you know, where we have fallen short. It can be embarrassing. It can be, you know, it, it can just be difficult many times to deal with that. But let us not resent the discipline. No, I don't have- he loves you with an everlasting love. He is an awesome God. But when left to my devices, I go astray and I need corrected. And no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Oh, Lord, I know I should have done it this way and I didn't and I know I didn't obey you and I'm, you know, I'm hurt because I displeased him. I displeased him. But God says, that's okay. I understand you know now. And God's in the process of building character. God's in the process of building faith. God's in the process of teaching us love. God's in the process of working righteousness in our lives so that we grow up unto him a strong and mature child. Bearing fruits of righteousness as we go along. So do these believers in need of correction... And in need of any believers here this morning who need correction, he says, therefore, strengthen, verse 12, the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Strengthen those. You know, I think the writer of Hebrews was a sports fan. He's been talking about running the race. He's been talking about, you know, being in the race. And so many of his illustrations are about athletes. And here's the spiritual runner, so to speak. And he says, be encouraged. Don't be moping around. Don't be discouraged. Don't be disappointed. Stay in the race. Don't give up. You're going to make it to the finish line. Learn the lessons of faith that God is teaching and run. Learn the lessons and run. You know, those teams that are going to be playing in the Super Bowl this afternoon, they trained. They trained hard to get to where they are out of all the other teams in the, you know, in the league. And these are the, after everybody else has been sorted out, you know, for whatever reason, they're there for, for a reason, you know. And it's quite interesting. We have the number one defense against the number one offense. You know, these, these teams trained. Well, in the spiritual race of life, of faith, We need to train. And we can't, you know, get defeated when God disciplines us and get discouraged when He when when He when He when He rebukes us. We're gonna make it because we're gonna learn and we're gonna grow. And the last thing he says is make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. I thought about that verse for a while. First of all, he's talking about me, but then he's talking about someone else. Make straight paths for your feet. Stay on course. Concentrate. Proverbs 4.27 says, don't turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. God has spoken today that you have got something He wants to deal with with you, then deal with it. Stay on course. Don't turn to the left, to the right. Don't make excuses. Deal with it. And as we run... What he's saying here then, leave something for others who are to follow. So they too might be encouraged. So that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Now, maybe I'm applying this wrong. But I believe what he's saying here is you you stay on the course. As you stay concentrated. As you have set the Lord before you and you are moving towards the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I believe that what he's saying, there's going to be others coming along just like you. Others that are not going to be, you know, really feeling so confident about, you know, finishing this race. Some that, you know, are, are going to come up lame or, or think that they are. And he's saying here, your testimony will work like the testimony of those referred. Remember the cloud of witnesses as they were, as we talked about last week? 
Those were the encour- those were the encouragers. Look, they have run the race and they've won. They finished the course. And so there are going to be others coming up behind you who may be all but giving up themselves. But when they hear about your testimony and they see how God has dealt with you and how you responded to God working in your life, then that gives them courage to press on towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus as well. I believe God will use you in your life as an influence on others. Those that are discouraged, who may be in the process of, you know, faltering, coming up lame. And he's going to use you in their lives to keep them going as well. We don't have any other choice, do we? We're in the race. We're going to finish the race. We're going to finish the course because we're not doing it in the end. We're doing it in the power of the living God working in our lives. Others may come along who will go through the same trials and tribulations and things that you are going through. And they'll see that you made it by trusting in the Lord. And I pray that he would strengthen you. If you need discipline, then I pray that he'll discipline you. I pray that for myself. That he will discipline me. That I may learn and grow and mature. That I might set the example for those who are to follow. Jesus said on one occasion, after some disciples who had been following him and they didn't like really the message that he said. And they left. They left in multitudes from following him. And he looked at the disciples and he said, are you two going to go? And Peter, and you got to love him. I love his brashness. I love the way he just kind of speaks out. <laughs> says, Lord, where are we going to go? Because you have the words of life. God speaks life to us. He speaks encouragement to us. He speaks hope to us. He speaks comfort to us. He speaks love to us. And he does correct us. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Receive his discipline. Learn from it. Grow. Mature. Run that race. We're going to finish the course. Let's pray. Father, as we read these words today, Lord, as we read about believers who had drifted from the word, who began to doubt in their own hearts, God, began to be discouraged, even to the point where saying, I don't know how seriously I take this anymore. And Father, I pray for each one here today that we haven't come to that place. I pray, pray today, Lord, that we are assured that the Bible is the living word of God, alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart of man. And I pray today, Lord, in the quietness of this moment. Lord, maybe there are some today, Lord, that we realize now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that whom you love, you chasten, because we're sons and daughters in your family. Because you love us, Lord, you will chasten us. Father, I pray that if there are any here today, Lord, that you're speaking to, that, Lord, are, are, are compromising in their walk of faith, living in situations they shouldn't be living in, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. I pray, Lord, today that a gentle rebuke will cause them to come before the throne of grace to receive mercy, to find grace, to help in time of need as they would ask for forgiveness. So that, Lord, your chastening hand would not have to deal with them in that situation. That they would not need scourging. Father, it's a personal walk. 
And so each one of us, Lord, as individuals, have to allow your spirit to search our own hearts. But Lord, as Peter said, we know that you have the words of life. And so God, today we pray for those places, Lord, in our lives that need healed, that they would be healed, Lord, that we could know the grace of your life, Lord. I pray for believers today. But Lord, I also pray for those who have never come into a personal living relationship with you through faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, today that they as Peter would realize and know that where are we going to go? There is no other place to go. No one else offers the free gift of eternal life. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so, Father, if any have joined us today, if any have come to join us in our in our congregation today and in our service today, who have never come into a personal and living relationship with you through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray today would be the day. I pray today, Lord, though they may not understand everything that entails in that walk of faith, that that wouldn't divert them or wouldn't discourage them or wouldn't cause them to say, I've got to know more but that they would take that step of faith, which is taking you at your word. Because you've told us you love this world so much that you gave your only begotten son that whosoever would believe in you would not perish but would have everlasting life. So Father, if there are any here today who have never come into a personal and living relationship with you through faith in your son, Jesus Christ, may today be the day that they take that step of faith. Knowing that you'll teach them as they go. And I pray, Lord, if any, if there's any here, Lord, that would say yes to you this morning, that, God, you give us the privilege of praying with them. And so I ask today, I give an invitation. If you've never come to that place of faith, I'm not talking about, once again, going to church. I'm not talking about going through church rituals. I'm not talking about having your name written in church registers. I'm talking about having your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life in blood because of what Jesus did to the cross for you. And if you will recognize in your own heart that you are a sinner who needs a Savior and that Jesus Christ is that Savior who will save you from your sin because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So no one is exempt or immune from that. But he says the free gift of God is eternal life through faith in Christ. And so if I can pray for you this morning, if you would come to that place of faith in your life to step up and be accountable to him who was accountable to you. We want to pray for you. Will you acknowledge in your life today if you've never come to that place of decision that today is the day that you know Jesus loves you enough that he went to Calvary 2,000 years ago for you, that he loves you so much that he would go to wash away and to take away your sin. Can I pray for you today? Is there anyone who's joined us today that would say, yes, I need Christ. I want to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I confess my sin before you today. If that's you today, will you just lift your head where you're seated this morning? Just lift your head and look at me so that I know that you want me to pray for you. Is there anyone at all? I'm looking around the room right now. You want to receive Christ today? Knowing that his loving arms are outstretched, calling out to you today as he wants to know. He wants you to know that you will be in his heavenly kingdom when you cross that line into eternity. Is there anyone at all, anyone at all that I could pray for this morning? Anyone? Just lift your head and just look at me. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. One last time around the room. One last time. Father, we are ever so blessed that you would allow your son, Jesus Christ, to come to this world, to pay the penalty for our sin, to take it away. 
Lord, as we're in the race, as we're running that race, may, Lord, we run with confidence because we trust you. Because we want to be obedient. Because we want to learn. We want to grow. We want our lives to shine forth the praises of our God who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, we bless you today. Thank you, Lord, that we're really without excuse here today. Thank you for your love. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for caring. Give us the strength to run the race. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Pray that this week would be an awesome week. As you draw near to the Lord, that you know his presence with you. He is just taking you by the hand and to draw you in, to give you just what you need. That love, that tenderness, that care, that encouragement, that little nudge. blessing as you walk with him. God bless you. bless you guys. Thanks for coming out today to worship with us and uh, hope to see you here this afternoon and um, have a great week. Stick around and fellowship with one another. We'll see you next week. It's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and it's there to encourage us and to strengthen us and to build us up uh, in our walk in Jesus Christ. And we're going to look uh, really at just one verse today. The, um, the message is entitled Pursue Peace. Pursue Peace. And it's verse 14 in Hebrews chapter 12. Does anyone need a Bible this morning? If you need a Bible, just raise your hand and we'll get a Bible put in your hand. I see one over here. Anybody else need a Bible? In uh, Calvary Chapel, we like to uh, look, you know, verse by verse. And since we're only doing one verse in, uh, in our study this morning, uh, we will kind of skip around, look at a couple, couple extra verses this morning. So uh, uh, I'd like to have, have you have a Bible in your hand. You know, the closer we get to the end of the book of Hebrews, the more I, I, I want it to keep going. It's, it is such a book of, of encouragement. Uh, there are challenges, certainly, in the book of Hebrews for believers in our daily walk, but, but those challenges and those exhortations are for just that, to encourage us and to build us up and to strengthen us uh, as we run the race of faith. And so this book is one of the most encouraging books in the entire Bible. I, I just I, I hope that you have been as excited as I have uh, in going through the book verse by verse and book by book. 
To stay in the race, the writer of Hebrews is now impressing upon these Jewish believers who are being persecuted, who are being intimidated, and who are being challenged by their non-believing Jews in their midst. They're being challenged because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so the writer of Hebrews now uh, is, is continuing to exhort them in their faith, in their walk of faith, not to return back to their Jewish roots and to the, and to the, uh, to the law given by Moses, but to continue walking in faith. And so he gives some practical application to apply to their lives. This part of the book of Hebrews is really about putting it into practice. All of the things, all of the arguments that we have given why Jesus is the better way. He is now telling them, okay, now that you understand the premise, now that the, that the truth has, has been delivered, then here's what to do. Here's what we do in demonstrating this in our lives. And so the practical application. And verse 14 is one of those challenges that we all must address as believers, as we too are committed to the race. And he says in verse 14 of chapter 12, pursue peace. With all men and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace. Father, we pray that you would anoint our hearts and our ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us today. Lord, maybe that we would be challenged, even in our walk, as we run the race. As we're committed to the race, to finish the course. Father, we pray that you would anoint your word. And God, that you would minister to our hearts. As Lord, your word challenges us to pursue peace with all men. And holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So Father, help us, God, as we just look at this verse for a moment. That, Lord, we would be, as you say, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, peacemakers. We ask, Lord, for your blessing upon our gathering this morning. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. The word pursue, to me, just means get after it. You know where you're going. You know what you're after. You know what you want. Don't be distracted. Peace is a goal to head off to San Francisco with some flowers in my hair. (laughs) That way you would let people know that you were part of that peace, love, dove generation. Amen? You know what I mean? (laughs) And you were probably singing the, uh, the, the John Lennon classic, All We Are Saying Is Give Peace a Chance, or maybe Stop, Hey. What's that sound? Everybody look what's going down that some one-hit wonder of the 60s, you know, (laughs) recorded. You may have even worn the famous peace badge, the upside-down broken cross, when in actuality was a blasphemous statement symbolizing the rejection of Jesus Christ, who is indeed the Prince of Peace. Did you know that? But that's what that symbol in ancient times stood for. That upside down broken cross, the peace symbol. It was actually symbolizing uh, the rejection of Jesus Christ. I can't believe that Satan got so many of us to actually embrace that and wear that without even knowing what it meant. Without even knowing what it meant. But the cry of the day then, in the 60s and now, is peace. The world wants peace. We want peace. Even today as there is a tension in the world today, as war seems to be imminent with Iraq, so the peace demonstrations and the marches are making the headlines today. Coming down here, uh, I read two headlines in the Boulder camera today about peace and the peace marches and the different things that were going on. And so we're having those same marches and those same demonstrations as they did in the 60s. Now, of course, we know that the absence of war, we don't want war, and so we know that the absence of war was written when the doors of the temple of the Roman war god Janus were shut. 
The doors were shut because there was no war. There was no active fighting going on. But we know that the hearts of the people were not experiencing peace any more than, than the hearts of people today as we read this letter of Hebrews in 2003. The world continues to be increasingly more and more violent. The threat of war continues to hang over us. The United Nations have established a, a peacekeeping force, and it's a joke. Because they can't keep peace, they can't maintain peace. We have peace summits, and peace summits are a joke too, because anytime there's a peace accord that's, assigned, that's signed, war just simply breaks out again. There's been no lasting peace from them, and the pacifists and the conscientious objectors it's futile in their attempts, really. At best, they just put a band-aid on an open wound because when there is no invasive and aggressive action that's taken in due time, like an infection, it only festers up and war is always on someone's horizon. War is always on someone's horizon. Look out your window. Read the papers. Watch TV. Forty years after the Vietnam War is over, when we really got accustomed to these, these protesters and all, that we're still crying peace. Having seen war come to our own shores hasn't done anything in our approach. We still just holler out, no, no war. We don't want war. We want peace. But the plan of crying out like this isn't working. So what is it? I tell you what, not only is the cry for peace not working around the world, it's not working in our neighborhoods either, is it? Do you lock your doors at night or do you leave your doors open in your neighborhoods? You know what the problem is? There's even war that's going on between, behind our closed doors at night when we go home. There's wars in our own homes that are going on. And sadly, we're struggling even in the church community. Even within the body of Christ, there's war that's going on. There's not peace even in our own hearts. And I guess that could sound pretty pessimistic, couldn't it? I mean, what do we do? Well, if it were not for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, knowing that one day He, who is the Prince of Peace, will come and establish His reign of peace upon this earth. But do you know when He comes, it says that He will establish that reign of peace with a rod of iron. He's going to establish peace with a rod of iron. But what do we do in the meantime? What about today? What about in your life and in my life? We're exhorted to pursue peace. That's what the scripture says right here. Pursue peace in our own lives with all men. This is not the only exhortation in scripture for believers to pursue peace. And we'll just look at one book. Turn to the book of Romans. Turn to Paul's letter to the Romans. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. And in Romans chapter 14, in verse 19, Paul writes to these believers, and he says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify one another. Let us pursue the things that make for peace, and the things by which one may edify one another. Is that how it is with you? Is that how it is in your life? Is that how it is in your home? Is that how it is in the workplace with you? What you do, how you act, is it making for peace, and is it edifying those in your midst and who you're coming into contact with? Turn back one chapter or two chapters to chapter 12 and look at verse 18 of Romans chapter 12. He tells us if it is possible, if it's possible, much as depends on you, live peacefully with all men, peaceably with all men. Well, is it possible? Is it possible? You bet it is. As much as is within you, it's kind of like how much do I want to live in peace? with those around me, in my circle of influence. If it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Well, Richie, you don't understand what that person said to me. You don't know how that person treated me. 
You don't know what I've gone through. Is it possible? Is it possible to change that attitude? To surrender your life to the will and the power of the Holy Spirit and allow Him to mold you and shape you and conform you into the image of the Prince of Peace? As much as is within you. Turn over to Romans chapter 10, back a couple other books. In Romans 15, because you see, we don't want anyone to come back to us and say that we did not do all that was possible. In Romans chapter 10, verse 15, just uh, drop down in the, in, in the verse part way here, and it says, How beautiful. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. The word preach means to herald, to proclaim the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus builds a little rung of ladders, a little ladder here with different rungs. And these beatitudes... And in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So what are we doing here? It's pretty apparent that as the writer of Hebrews says, there's something that we are to do here in regard to this as we run the race of faith. Pursue peace. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, you know. You're the sons of God. Pursue peace with all people, with all men, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. What does that mean to me today? What does that mean to me? It's obvious it doesn't mean do nothing. The word pursue in itself is an active word. It means go after it. Do something. And so the protesters and the people who march, you know, the peace activists, they say, will passively resist. That's what we're going to do. And many Christian groups join in the protest. But in the Sermon on the Mount, I hope that we notice that Jesus didn't say, blessed are the pacifists. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Those who are pursuing peace. Now, interestingly, you, we also know in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus said, don't think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Whew. Wow, that's pretty wild. <laughs> Is there a contradiction there? He's talking about blessed are the peacemakers, and now he's saying, I didn't come to bring peace, you know, but a sword. Well, I'll tell you what, there's not a contradiction if he said it. Because he's not going to contradict himself. God's word will not contradict itself. And Jesus isn't going to contradict his word. So what's it all about? A peacemaker is one who is pursuing peace. He's actively, aggressively uh, going towards that end. It's more than being in a passive state of resistance or existence. And it's more than getting in between two fighting factions It's more than the absence and fightings of war. In pursuing peace, there in fact may be a conflict. There may be a conflict on the part of the one pursuing it. Still many think that the Christian's role as being peacemakers in the world and in society is to just lay back and passively resist. But you see the battle to change the illustration goes far beyond what one might think will bring peace, and it goes a lot deeper than what one might expect. The truth is, the leaders of the world can sit around the peace tables and sign all the agreements they want. Uh, they can do whatever they want, but there's a deeper issue that needs to be addressed if peace is going to have a chance. If peace is going to have a chance. And so to bring it home now to our heart, what does it mean to us here today? When we read you, believers, because the Word of God is really first and foremost directed to, to, to those of us who have come into a personal and living relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so it's, it's about believers. We are to pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. No matter how idealistically one approaches this issue, realistically there is an aggressive act that generally is going to take place if peace is to have a chance. For peace to be a reality in the world, there's an issue that has to be dealt with in the heart of man, and it's called sin. That's what has to be dealt with. 
Because that's what's causing the violence in the world today. That's what causes the, 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 the murders and the hatred and, and, and all of the, the crimes that are going on. And that must be addressed. And that's what Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, came to do 2,000 years ago. His sole purpose was that of addressing the issue in the heart of man, which is sin. He knew that peace starts with individuals. He knew that it started with an individual and, effect, and individuals then in turn affecting other individuals. He knew that the heart of the matter was the individual heart. He didn't sit around passively like a Gandhi who was hoping that people would follow his example and be nice to one another out of the goodness of their heart. That wasn't what Jesus did. Jesus took action. He endured the cross, despising the shame, to bring peace. To bring, to bring peace about meant conflict within. Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. And there was also then conflict without Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And in obedience to the Father, he went to the cross. He went to the cross. You see, until the real issue is dealt with sin in the heart of man, the desired hope for peace will never be realized. And so in our lives and in our hearts to pursue peace is to get after it. Get after this issue with all men to understand sin, that which separates them from God. That's the issue. That's the issue. And so with all men, you know, maybe that's all men within our circle of influence. You know, I can't have an influence on Saddam Hussein. But I can have an influence on the people that I work with, the people I go to school with, the people that, you know, I... I run into on a day-to-day -day basis and the people within our church family. The Greek word that's used here is Irene. That's the word for peace, Irene. And it's really the Hebrew equivalent of shalom. That's a word that we're more familiar with. The word shalom it means peace. And what that word really means is God's highest and best for you. Shalom. When, 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 the, when the Jewish person would greet you with the word shalom, they're saying God's best and His highest for you. And so in pursuing peace, we are seeking God's highest and best for everyone in our circle of influence. Our non-believing family members, those who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. For our neighbors, our co-workers, our employers, our employees, our classmates, our teachers, your husband, your wife, your parents, your children, your brothers and sisters in your church family. Is there anyone I missed? Uh, even the guy that cut you off, you know, on a, on a corner the other day. Or, or, or scooted in line or got that parking place. You know, here, oh, I see that parking place. I just got to go around, you know. And he's whipped right in there, man. Somebody else got it. Or cut you out of line someplace. Yeah, that person too. That person too. And so a goal of mine and yours as believers in running the race must be to be a source of peace and pursue it. To show the Prince of Peace and dwell in our hearts and our lives. With non-believers, it's to, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine that they may see your good works. You know, Nancy was driving me back from the doctor last week. And... Um, well, let's just put it this way. You know, we were taking our time. And there was a guy behind us that was, he was anxious. Oh, boy. And, and all of a sudden, this person pulls over into the right, you know, onto the right shoulder. We're coming up to a stop line there, like there on South Border Road, and this person's coming up, you know, 
and, 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 and zinging up behind on the right shoulder, you know. And uh, there's not room, really, before we get right for this guy to really get up there in front of us. And so, you know, we go just a little faster, and then this person turns off on a driveway that, that, that's going off of South Boulder Road, but they waved as they went by. <laughs> and, and it wasn't, you know, the old friendly, that's okay, everything's all right, <laughs> you know, they waved. <laughs> it was a pointed remark, should I say. <laughs> but Nancy, that they may see her good work, she didn't wave back. Now, me, I was ready to wave. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but as Paul also wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, Nancy didn't wave back that she might be blameless. Well, turn to Philippians chapter 2 so you can read this yourself. Because you see, it's all a part of our actions. It's all a part of our attitudes. It's how a, a part of how we are, are interacting. So Philippians, let me see here. I've got to find it myself. Philippians chapter 2. I'm there. Are you there? <laughs> okay. What page is it, Richard? Oh, you're not there either. <laughs> page 1401. Hey, that's what it says right here. You got it too? 14, Gary's got 1401. <laughs> okay, Nancy, my wife, everybody has the, the new King James, the Nelson. Uh <laughs> okay, anyway, Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter 2... Verses 15, that, um, is that right? Yeah, I was in chapter 3 here, verse 2, yeah. That, um, where am I? That you may become blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. <coughs> Excuse me. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. You see, to have waved back, well, then we wouldn't be blameless and harmless, would we? <laughs> but we want to be blameless and harmless. Children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day, Paul says, of Christ, that I have not run in vain. We don't want to run in vain. We want to be pursuing peace and letting our light shine so that we haven't labored in vain. Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, having your conduct honorable among those who are on the outside, Gentiles, that when they speak against you, you and I can stop it. Hopefully my life and yours as believers will influence others towards peace, towards the prince of peace, the non-believer that they may know the peace of God that passes all understanding because until they have made peace with God, through faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what? They're going to make life miserable for themselves and miserable for everyone around them. Because that anger is just going to stir up and that hatred and that division and that divisiveness. So we want to show them Christ. Let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And then also, you know, not only to those without, but then the interacting relationships that we have with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. There can be conflict amongst us as believers as we seek to engage one another with our life and our lifestyle. But in pursuing peace, we press on. There is never an excuse in the believer's life to be rude or to be unkind in our relationship with others. Rather, we're to pursue peace because we're his ambassadors of peace. We're his ambassadors. That's the badge that we wear today. When we take upon ourselves the name of Christ, then that's the badge that we wear, that we are his ambassadors and we are ambassadors of peace because Jesus said, peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, but my peace I give unto you. So all that is, as much as it's possible... If he's given us his peace, then it's possible. Because all things are possible with God. To pursue it and to demonstrate and to show that peace that passes all understanding to those who are without as well as to those who are within. So is there something in your life that causes others? You know, that's what we want to know. Is there something in your life that's causing others to seek out a relationship with Christ or for brothers and sisters to deepen a relationship with Him. Are we an instrument of His peace or are we sowing discord among the brethren? 
Those are questions that we have to ask our own lives here in the fellowship. The command is to pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, I'm to pursue peace and holiness. Now, some, you know, have interpreted this as, as wow, is he changing his direction here on what he's saying? Because uh, he's been talking about a faith-oriented relationship. Is he now talking about a works-oriented relationship with God? No, it goes against everything that the whole letter has been talking about faith. He's not talking about here as we're seeking holiness in our lives, that if I just do enough, I'll be holy enough to be, you know, accepted by God. That's not what he's saying. We're accepted by God because of one thing. Because Jesus Christ died for us at Calvary and we believe in Him. And that blood that He shed up on Calvary's cross has washed us clean. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Okay? And so, um, we're not going to produce holiness in our own life by our own efforts. What the writer is talking about here is practical holiness, not positional. Positional holiness is what Christ has done for us. We believe it. We are positionally in a right, declared righteous before God. But there is practical holiness that he's talking about here. And this is what we're exhorted to do, to be holy, even as I am holy, we read in the Scripture. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul writes, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. See, we're talking about practical holiness. Our life should demonstrate a holiness, a righteousness in the world because of our, our relationship. Because of our relationship with Jesus Christ who lives in us. In chapter 5, verse 27 of Ephesians, he says that he, Jesus, might present her, his bride, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. First, um, first Peter chapter 1, verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Okay, The word holy means sanctified, set apart. So our lives are designated here now to strive towards holiness, practical holiness in our lives. That's what we're to pursue as we pursue peace with all men and holiness, that we be sanctified and set apart you know, by a life that glorifies God, by a, by a lifestyle that honors Him. Holiness is that which would describe the fact that believers are different. We're different. We are in the world. It would say that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're not flowing down that same river that everybody else is flowing down. You know, we're bucking the, we're, we're bucking the, the current. We're going across the current. You know, we are in the world, but not of the world. We are different. We are different. Our thoughts should be. Our behavior is different. Or it should be. Our attitudes are different. Or they should be. Our actions, the things that we do, the things that we say should be different from those who are in the world. Practical holiness in our lives is that we are in the world, but not of it. We are children of the living God. Holiness is, that which cause, holiness is that which causes one to see God. Now, what did it say right here? Pursue peace with all men and holiness, because apart from that, no one will see God. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, just before he said, blessed are the peacemakers, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God. The pure in heart, those who are holy and righteous before Him through faith in Him. And so we as Christians today, we see God in a different light than the people in the world do. You know, people in the world have such a different view of God. You know, those who have not surrendered their life to Him, they see Him in such a different way than we do as Christians. We see Him as our loving Father who is in heaven. We see Him as one who brings comfort to our lives, who brings peace and joy and, and, and who is there to strengthen us and heal us and forgive us and save us. And we see him in such a manner that, no one, that the people in the world, they, they, they don't see him like that until their hearts have been softened and their eyes have been opened. They see God as something else. But So we see God. We see him as he is. But no one can see him apart from his work of righteousness in their life. And that's what this verse is saying. And as believers, God has worked in your life. If you've called upon the name of the Lord to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He has done a work of grace in your life. You are different from that person in the world. So for one to see the Lord, peace with God has been made, established in your heart through the forgiveness of sin, and you are declared righteous, and then your light shines forth. And this is an awesome thing that we have as His representatives and as His ambassadors today, that people would look at our lives and that they would see God. They would see the one true living God. 
exalted, high and lifted up in our lives. And my life is Christ-like. Okay? It's not richy like Sometimes it is, and that's pretty ugly. But you know, it's Christ-like. That's what I want my life to show forth. I think this writer is just awesome in the way God has anointed him to exhort these believers to see and know the one true living God. That's what he's talking about. Pursue peace. Pursue peace with all men and holiness, apart from which no one will see him. It's not through works of the law, the writer's saying. You're not going to see God through the works of the law. That's what those non-believing Jews were trying to, to get these believers to go back to. And that won't bring peace within. And that won't bring peace without either. It certainly won't produce positional or pra- practical holiness in one's life. It's only through faith in believing God and trusting Jesus Christ as one's personal Lord and Savior. That's where it all starts. You know, there's an interesting verse that we'll close with in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 20. You can turn there if you want. I'll just kind of to read a little bit what it says here. Zechari- you can write it down, Zechariah 40, 20, because it says in that day. What day is that? In the day that Christ comes to reign and to rule upon the earth, in that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved in the bells of the horses. In their bridles, it'll be engraved. Holiness to the Lord. And so with every movement of that horse, you know, as that horse is moving, you hear the little tingling of the bells on their bridles and all. It's speaking holiness to the Lord. You know, it's glorifying and honoring and exalting God for who He is. And so that's how it would be in our lives as we honor Him. That our lives would have a little tinkling sound that they would hear holiness of the Lord because God has washed us clean with his blood we've been forgiven of our sin and we are washed clean I pray that God would use your life pray that he would use mine to pursue peace with all men and you can narrow that down to the men and women in your circle of influence That's all. You don't have to go any further than that. But to pursue peace, to let them see that the Prince of Peace has made a difference in your life. And holiness, because apart from which no one will see Him. And you have seen Him. If you've called upon the name of the Lord and He is your Lord and Savior, your personal Lord and Savior today, you have seen Him. High and lifted up and exalted He's your God. May they see him at work in your life. And may they see him as you see him. Let's pray before we go before the communion table. Father, a pretty simple exhortation, yet at the same time, it can be difficult. Pursue peace with all men. And holiness apart from which no one will see the Lord. Take our lives, Lord. Father, as believers today, if we have been on any other course of action than pursuing peace and holiness, Father, I pray, God, right now, even now, Lord, before we will partake from the communion table, the communion elements, Lord, I pray, Father, that we, as believers, would come clean before you. And confess our sin. And God that we would be instruments of peace in your hand. That we would be peacemakers. Among ourselves in the body of Christ. As well as Lord. To those in our out circle of influence. And Father today is. As we come to partake once again of the communion table. Lord, we're reminded of just how awesome, Lord, this memorial is. Because, Lord, you left this to remember for us, your, your people, your church, your bride, to remember that you are alive today and living, seated at the right hand of the Father. Yes, your body 
your body was broken. Not a bone, but your body was broken. And your blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sin. You died that we might have life. And you live today and are coming again to receive us unto yourself. That where you are, there we may be also. And Lord Jesus, we anticipate that day in our lives right now. And so, Father, as we prepare to partake of this memorial that you said for us to remember, do this in remembrance of me, because I'm coming. I'm coming again. And so, Father, as we prepare our hearts to remember, this is the highest, Lord, I believe, form of worship, an act of worship that we can, can even offer to you. And that's why the scripture says, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you are not to partake of the communion table. It's not to exclude any, and that's why Jesus came to the cross, to include all. All who will call upon his name. And so, before we, before we pass out the communion elements, as, as God would be speaking to your heart, have you come into that personal and living relationship with God through faith? That you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Lamb of God who came to die for your sins, 2,000 years ago? And have you called upon him confessing that you are a sinner who needs a Savior and that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? And so with that, you know, we ask today. We give an invitation because we don't want any to feel excluded from partaking of the communion uh, that we pass out today with the Lord. But the Bible is very clear. that a non-believer, it means nothing, so why do it? And so to all who are here today, have you made that commitment to Christ? Have you come into that living and personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ? Are you forgiven of your sin because of that faith? If not, can I pray for you today before we pass out the the communion elements? If you've never opened your heart and confessed that you are a sinner who needs a Savior before Christ, will today be the day? If you want me to pray for you, if you want to receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior today, just lift your head where you're seated this morning before we, before we begin the, 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 the last part of the service today. If you want to receive Christ and you want me to pray for you, just lift your head where you're seated today and look me right in the eye, right in the eye that you want to receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior this morning. Can I pray for you? Is there anyone, anyone at all that I can pray for today? Just look at me. Make sure that I see you if you're looking at me. Because we don't want anyone to feel excluded today as we celebrate and rejoice the one true and living God, Jesus Christ. And we want to know, as he does, that you're going to be in heaven because you believe in him. Is there anyone, anyone this morning, anyone at all? Oh, Father, we thank you for this word today, Lord. May our hearts be challenged, Lord, to pursue peace with all men and holiness, apart from which no one will see you. We want our lives, Lord, to reflect the grace of the Prince of Peace. Prepare our hearts now just to receive the communion elements. We ask, Lord, that you just pour your spirit out upon us and touch us, God. Touch us right now. Maybe there's some things, Lord, that we need to just really bring before you right now in our lives. Maybe there's a healing. Maybe there's a confession. You know Go before the Lord as we prepare to pass out the communion elements. In Jesus' name, amen.
live my life. Lord, I want to live my life to please you. I bring my heart before you to remove. Make of me a vessel fit for honor that I might shine for you and me. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. And through him both may have access by one spirit to the Father. Lord, with that, thank you for the peace, God, that we, that was made, Lord, by you on our behalf, Lord, that, Lord, we may have fellowship and communion with you, intimacy, Lord, with you, Father, that we can be changed from the inside out, a person, a whole new man, because we've been forgiven of our sin. Through faith in you. Lord, it is indeed humbling that we come today to receive at the communion table, Lord, as we're reminded, God, of your grace, the grace of your love demonstrated to us at Calvary's cross. When you laid your body down, where your body was broken your blood was shed for the forgiveness of sin Lord God we are humbled Lord today as we're just reminded as we come to fellowship and commune with you we bless you Jesus for caring for us so much Thank you, God, for in the whole plan, for the whole plan of eternity, God. You took care of business for us. And we praise you for that today. As we would partake of the communion table. see from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat 
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask Rex to pray for us right now. Almighty God, most blessed and loving Heavenly Father, it is in the holy name of Jesus and for his sake and in remembrance of his life, his death, and praise to you, his resurrection, that we humble ourselves before your throne. Father, as we hold this unleavened bread, we are reminded of the body that you took, Lord Jesus, when you left all the riches and glory of heaven to come to this earth. The body that you assumed, O oh Lord, when that was rejected by your people. The body that suffered harassment. The body that you allowed to be hurt, to be hung on a cross, O Lord, to do what we could not do for ourselves for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we thank you for this memorial, and we pray that you would be glorified here. Accept our worship now, for we offer it in love and in reverence, in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. And so it is in Jesus' name that we honor him in remembrance of him. So we partake together. And in the same manner, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Scott, will you pray for us? Father, we thank you for the gift of eternal life that you give us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you would shed your blood for us, that we would be spared, God, but that you would go in our place. And Lord, you didn't deserve what happened to you, but you did it because you loved us so much. And we know, Lord, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. We thank you, Lord, that you would shed your blood for us. And as we just partake in this part of the table, Lord, we thank you and praise you and give you glory in Jesus' name. So in remembrance of him until he comes, let's partake together.
thank God just truly send each and every one of us out this week to go out and throw some seed as He gives the in- increase. But He gives us opportunities just to share our faith with folks. And so may we all have that this week. Have a great week. God bless you all. Stick around and fellowship with one another. There's coffee and tea and probably some stuff to snack on. So we'll see you next Sunday.